Okay, um, would you open your Bibles, uh, please, to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 1. I'd like to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled, Get in the Game. Get in the Game. Uh, please be have your Bibles open. We're going to be flipping through the Bible. You know, we all need to be familiar with our Bibles. We need to know where the book of Genesis is. And we need to be able to get to those minor prophets if we have to. And, and, uh, and we should, you know, it's, we put verses on the screen to help, especially if I'm just maybe flying through something pretty quick. Uh, but I want you to turn to passages and, and just really get familiar with, with your Bibles. And so, um, uh, We'll not just be in Second Samuel, we're just going to use this as a bit of a springboard today as we talk about getting in the game, uh, but I would also like you to have the book of Genesis readily available. We'll be flipping there uh, pretty quick here into the message. So Second Samuel chapter 11, uh, verse 1, says this. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David, and David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And we'll just stop right there and commit this message to the Lord in prayer. Father, count it a great privilege today to stand before you and and speak to the men, Lord, about getting in the game. But Lord, this is not just a message for men. This is a message for everyone that would name the name of Christ. God, for you call all of us to step up and to go for it. Lord, would you please help us today as we look at this important, important topic on this great day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, King David was the greatest king that Israel ever had, but he made a mistake. Uh, He put himself on the sideline. He chose to stay home when he should have been at war. We just read the passage, and it slips right by if you're not careful, but it says, at the time when kings go out to war, David stayed home. He was at home resting. And there's a time for rest, most assuredly, but it was not a time for rest. It was a time to be at war. It was a time to fight. It was a time to get in the game, as as I'm saying today, but he he said, no, 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 I'm just going to sit on the sidelines. I've, I'm, I'm comfortable. I've established my kingdom. I've got other people that can do my job for me. And this eventually led to compromise in his life. Compromise then led to sin. The result was lives that were ruined, even killed, because he stayed at home. Now, when I say that life is a game, you know I'm not talking you know, I don't really mean it's a game and there's no consequence and we're just having fun. That's not what I mean. I'm using an allegory. What you do has eternal consequences. What you do determines your destiny and affects the destiny of other people. It's not time to stay at home. It's time to get in the game. And I'm, I'm not just talking to the fathers here. This is just a gimmick to say Father's Day and I'm speaking to the men. And I don't really mean a gimmick because I do count it a great privilege to talk to men today because men need to rise up and take responsibility. And some of you need to stop letting your wives lead. And listen, my wife is the most amazing woman in the world and she leads because I ask her to lead and, and we work together. And so I'm not saying lord it over your wife and and put her on the sidelines. But I'm saying if all you're doing is sitting around and letting your wife make all the decisions while you watch TV, there's something wrong with that. Because God calls you to lead, guys. And ladies, maybe maybe you need to let him lead. Maybe you need to sit back and say, 
what should I do, honey? Do you want me to, should we buy the, what do you, what's your decision, honey? And if he says, I don't care, do whatever you want, then you say, well, you know, I'm just, why don't you pray about it, and I'm just going to wait for you to, to get an answer from the Lord. And, and there may be long-standing patterns that we need to correct. It might be hard. I'm, I'm, I'm in like five minutes in, and I'm way off my notes right now. <laughs> but no matter who you are, we need to step up. We need to be fully committed to Christ. Come on, look around, guys. Look around at the world. It's not time to, it's not time to play. You know, it's not time to, to just be consumed with entertainment. And there's a place for entertainment, but, but you've got to be fully committed to Christ. Getting in the game means that, that you, are, you are where you're supposed to be. You're, you're not just being an observer, but you're, you're being a participant. And so here, here's what I want to do today. I want us to look at six men in the Bible. They're all fathers. And we're going to pull out one characteristic from each of these men's lives. And, and we can apply it to your life. Now, don't try to apply all six. You know, just pick one, something that God's working in your life. And to make it easy. How many of you like easy? I like easy. To make it easy, every letter of the word father will stand for one of these characteristics. All right, people are already texting me about my message today because they're watching online. Okay, he said, please stay off your notes. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do that, but I'll. All right. Okay, so how do you get in the game? Uh, the F stands for follow God. Follow God. Uh, and, and here we're going to look at Noah. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, a very simple verse. It says, Noah found favor with the Lord. Noah found favor with the Lord. Now, if you look at it, we don't have time today to go into all the context of all these passages, so you're going to have to trust me. I'm going to tell you what it is, but go back and read it. Don't just take my word for it. Genesis chapter 6, it was an evil, wicked world. In fact, it says every inclination, every inclination of the heart of mankind was evil all the time. I think that might even be more evil than the world we're living in here today, if you can imagine that. But wickedness was prevailing on the earth. Wickedness was prevailing on the earth, and there was one man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and I want to be that man. And so this is the first step in being all in for Christ, is that you must receive the grace of the Lord. You know, you know brothers, that we have to have Christ in our lives, and we have to we have to receive the grace of the Lord. We have to live by God's grace. You know, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to falter and fail, but you need to get right back up again because God loves you and there is grace. You have to have faith. You must believe that God exists and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Do you seek him? What a promise the book of Hebrews tells us. He is a rewarder of all those that seek him. So if you want rewarded from God, just seek him and he will reward you. You have to follow God, brothers. And with faith comes obedience. This is what it means. It doesn't mean I just follow God. I go to church. No, 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 no. Faith is not just this intellectual acknowledgement. Yeah, I just believe God and then I do whatever the heck I want. And Sorry, I said the word heck on a Sunday sermon, but it's Father's Day. There's other pastors that say a lot worse things, but um, uh, listen, faith is not something that just appears on a list of what you believe. You know, it's not just you're filling out an application and you check, I'm a Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. I I'm talking about following God, walking by faith, living for Christ, Jesus first. You live by faith and faith lives by action, Okay. Faith is something that leads to action. Um, uh, James chapter 2, verse 14, it says, what good is it if you say you have faith, but you don't do anything? That kind of faith can't save anyone. If you see a brother or sister that has no food or clothing, and you say, hey, take care, have a good day, be warm and well fed, but then you don't do anything to meet their needs, that's not faith. 
faith by itself isn't enough. Faith by itself isn't enough. If it produces good deeds, if your faith motivates you to do something, that's real faith. And so Noah was a righteous man. He found favor in the eyes of God. The Bible says he was blameless among the people of his time. In this evil age, he walked by faith. But look at verse 22 of Genesis chapter 6. What does it say? It says, Noah did exactly everything as God had commanded him. You see, faith leads to obedience. And to say follow God means that you're going to obey God. The Bible says something, you're going to live by it. And this is how we follow God, by, by following the Bible. Uh, J. Charles Stern said, faith is fostered by prayer. Faith is fortified by the study of the word. And faith is fulfilled by yielding moment by moment to the Lord Jesus himself. Lord, what do you want me to do? Okay, I'm going to follow you. What do you want me to do? Okay, I'm going to follow you, God. I'm going to follow you. Help me to make the right, help me to make the right decisions, God. I'm going to follow you with my de decisions. So to be a man of God or a woman of God is to pray, to study the word, and to yield to Jesus moment by moment. That's F in the word Father. We've got five more. A is for act with purity. Act with purity. And for this, we stay in the book of Genesis. We go to Genesis chapter 39. I want to tell you about Joseph if you haven't met Joseph, you need to know him. Read uh, the latter chapters of the book of Genesis, starting in 39 uh, and moving, moving to the end of the book. You see, Joseph was abused and, and mistreated. And mistreated is a kind word. He was trafficked. He was sold into slavery. He had a, he had a rough go of it. But God had mercy on him, puts him into a place of influence, puts him into a place of leadership in the government. And he would make decisions that would literally affect the lives of almost everybody in the whole nation. He was making decisions and it was affecting a whole nation. Wouldn't you want to have a godly person in that position? Wouldn't you want to have somebody who's smart? It matters who you vote for, folks. It matters who you vote for. You better vote. <laughs> you better vote. It's the least you could do. Okay, Genesis 39, verse 6, it says, Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. You see there, maybe Joseph wasn't voted, and, and okay, let me democratize this passage <laughs> just for a second, okay? Let's just say Potiphar was voted in, and I know he wasn't, not in this culture, but let's just say he's the president. He's the leader. He's the head of the nation, right? He appointed Joseph, who's a godly man. So you got to vote for the right person who's going to appoint the right people. Because maybe the person in charge isn't a Christian, but maybe they'll appoint the Christian. Maybe they'll appoint, and not just a Christian, folks, but a really well versed, gifted Christian. Okay? Matters who you vote for. Okay, so Potiphar gives Joseph complete administrative responsibility. It says in verse 6 of Genesis 39, when Joseph was there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. And then the Bible tells us Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Why does the Bible say that? Well, because of verse 7. See, Joseph was good at what he did. He worked hard to please his boss, but he was also pleasing to his boss's wife. Verse 7, Genesis 39, Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Normally when we think of lust, we think of men lusting after women. But here you have a woman lusting after a man. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. A lot of men's dream right there. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He held back nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on him day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work, probably because she orchestrated that. Then verse 12, she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. And he paid a great price for that, by the way. 
but he acted with purity. You see, he knew how to deal with temptation. You cannot be a godly man today unless you know how to deal with temptation. Got to learn how to deal with temptation. And you make the decision now because now is a, a safe time. Hopefully nobody here is being tempted by it. But so now you say, okay, when I'm tempted, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look away. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to tell somebody, whatever, whatever that is, you, you understand your weakness now and you make a decision, I'm not going to put myself in a compromising situation. You act with purity because you're a dad. <laughs> because your life counts. Your life is not your own, guys. Your life is not your own. It impacts other people. What you do, what you even think affects other people's lives. And so, so you can't play around with this, man. You really can't. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I talked about this a few weeks ago. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. There's, there's no temptation that you're going to say, guys, I just can't do it. I can't. No, because this verse says that God's not going to do that. Any temptation you'll ever face, he'll give you a way out. And what, what was Joseph's way out? He ran away. Do you know he lost his job? Because of temptation. He said, there's too much temptation at my job, so I'm, I'm quitting. No two weeks notice, I'm out of here. Because this lady's going to bring me down. Nothing more important than your personal holiness. Matthew 26, 41, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. There it is from our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you a two-step formula to re recover from or to say no to temptation. Number one, you watch. Look at your life. Watch. Where's that temptation coming from? And you better pray. <laughs> God, help me, please. I mean, there are times, and I've done this for years, Man, where I will, I will walk in the morning and I'll pray, Lord, I pray I would never, ever commit adultery with my life. And I, I've prayed that since I first got married. I pray that I would never cheat on my wife. Because I know I could be a weak man, right? But I have to pray and I have to watch. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, I wish this would happen at the last service when I have so much time. Uh, wait, I have to show you this verse. Um, okay, so Proverbs, uh, let me see, Proverbs chapter 5 talks about the immoral woman. Uh, let me see here. Oh, Lord, help me find this. Um, oh, yeah, see, there's so much about the immoral woman. There's three whole chapters here, and I thought it was at the end. Okay, so I have the New Living Translation. Um, all right, so I'm going to have to look this up for the next two services. But uh, uh, brothers, it would be really smart for you to read through uh, Proverbs 6, 7, and 8. It talks about the immoral woman. And uh, uh, listen to me, my sons. Pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray towards her path. Don't wander down her wayward path. This is 726. For she has been the ruin of many. Many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Let me see. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, brothers, I can't find it. But there's a verse in here that says, All who were slain by her were strong men talks about how strong they thought they were. And so you just don't think, man, I've got this. No, man, the spirit is willing. I get it. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay? So to be fully committed to Christ, we follow God. We act in purity. Thirdly, we talk about the Lord. We talk about the Lord. And, and we're going to come back to the Old Testament, but go with me to the book of Acts. This is Acts chapter 8. Brothers, I get it. You know, we talk about sports. I like to talk about politics. You know, we talk about guns. Anybody like to talk about the Second Amendment? You know, uh, we talk about the heat, how hot it is. Do you talk about the Lord? Talk about the Lord. 
In, in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, it says the believers were scattered everywhere, preaching the good news about Jesus wherever they went. And then it mentions this guy, Philip, verse 5, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Everywhere Philip went, he was talking about Jesus. And as a father, I find it so important that I lead the conversation in my home about God. If you start talking about God, people are going to talk about God. If you don't talk about God, the conversation may never get to spiritual things. Just, just talk about God. What do you think about God? Has anybody prayed today? Have you read your Bible? You know, I read John. Do you know, does anybody know what John 3 says? I mean, you just talk about the Lord. It's so easy, guys. Come on. Just talk about God. Lead that conversation in the home. Don't be afraid. You don't have to know all the answers, okay? It's okay for people to ask you questions you don't know the answers to. But you can ask good questions. And if you've got a steady diet of God's word and you're spending time in prayer, you're going to be able to talk about the Lord. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Grace in your speech. Another way to say that is that your speech is attractive. The old preacher Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote, it's a sad fact that the tongues of professing Christians are often all too busy doing the devil's work. The tongues of professing Christians. Are you talking about what God's doing in your life? Steer conversations toward Jesus. This is how you lead. Speak encouragement to one another. Encourage one another. Speak to your spouse, those in your house, your friends, your coworkers. Encourage them in the things of God. Okay, so that's F-A-T, spells fat. But now the word H is have patience. <laughs> this is good for brothers. Have patience. Just relax. To get in the game, you have to be patient. Job, the book of Job. You know, relationships require patience, don't they? <laughs> no? Okay. Anybody here married? If you're married, you know you need patience. My wife's listening to me right now, so I better be careful <laughs> what I say. Since being a dad requires patience, you know, you have to listen to your children. You have to listen to their heart. Why am I crying so much today? You know, I, th I think because this is really personal for me, because I just want to be a great dad, man, you know? And my youngest is 14, and so I've, I've had, you know, a lot of years of being a dad. But we have to be patient. We have to be patient. Doctors aren't the only ones with patience. It's Father's Day. Come on, I, threw, I had to throw another one in there. All right, let me see. The book of Job is uh, right before Psalms. Okay, Job. Um, so Job, man, there's <laughs> nobody in the Bible had more patience than Job, my goodness. Um, uh, listen, you're going to go through suffering, okay? There are no exceptions here. Everyone here is going to go through suffering, as, and, and probably intense suffering. Pro probably suffering that, that you, you're, you're not ready for, and you won't be ready for it until you get there. And God will give you the grace you need to go through, but it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very painful. It's going to be very painful. Life brings suffering, no exceptions. And so you need to hear this. The lesson in, in Job to be patient in suffering because Job lost everything. He lost his kids, man. He lost, he didn't lose his wife. His wife's like, hey, why don't you curse God and die? So Satan left her alive because he was going to use her to try to trip him up, right? But he lost all his wealth in a day, lost his health in a day. All of his kids died lost his businesses, and then his friends come, and they're, oh my, oh, Job, man, we're so sorry, and they just sat there for seven days, they couldn't say anything, and then they, they made the mistake of trying to comfort him, trying to talk to him, and give him all these theological reasons why he's suffering, they should have kept their mouth shut, you know, people that are suffering don't need your, your explanations for their suffering, they just need your friendship and your presence there. They just need to know that you're with them and that you love them no matter what they go through. And you're going to be there with them. 
but he maintained his integrity. He kept believing. He stayed with the Lord. You know, he, he, he didn't suffer perfectly, but God brought him through it. Listen, you're going to go through profound suffering. It's a simple, it's a simple, simply the way of life. And it's in the, cru- the crucible of this suffering that your character is going to be forged. And you will learn compassion. And you will experience comfort. And, and, uh, and you will be able to, to uh, minister to others. Mike, oh, never mind. I got some here. I've never had to do this during a message before. Um. Uh, and, 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 and here's the thing, you know, suffering can make you bitter. If you're not careful, suffering will make you bitter. You'll start to be cynical. You'll start to hate God. You'll start to say, like, why, why am I going through this? Guard your heart, folks. Because suffering could also make you better. Bitter or better. All right? What's the difference? Bitter has an eye. It's not about you. Don't be expect to be delivered from every hard thing you're going to be called into. It's not how it works. You don't get to choose our suffering. Right? We don't get to choose how we're going to suffer. Uh, British critic uh, William Hazlitt said, it is better to drink of deep griefs than to taste shallow pleasures. I mean, show me somebody that suffered, and I'll show you some depth of character. Richard suffered. Casey suffered. Right? You want to talk about the Lord? You can talk to these people. They'll, they'll talk about the Lord. And I know there's many of you in here have suffered. I, just, I know their story a little bit more than some of you. Okay. Uh, the letter E in Father stands for uh, excel in love. Excel in love. Uh, Abraham. Abraham, Genesis chapter 22. Uh, I'm not going to go into this story very far here, but Genesis 22, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. <sighs> Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, Here I am. Take your son, your only son, which wasn't his only son because he had Ishmael too, but God only recognized Isaac because Isaac was a work of the spirit, not a work of the flesh. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Here's what I want you to know. Abraham loved Isaac. First time the word love appears in the Bible, Genesis 22. And it's talking about the love of a father to a son, which foreshadows the love of God to his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. So Abraham loved Isaac. Men, we need, to be, we need to be lovers of God and lovers of people. Man, you, you, we can't even fathom the intensity of this test that God was putting Abraham through, and I'm not going to really talk about this test, but, but, but I just want to say that we have to love God supremely. We have to be men of love. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, 37, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. You have to love God first. It's got to be your first love. It's got to be your first love. And if you're not sure if you love God first or not, you need to get alone with God and start wrestling with him and talking to him about that. Okay? Um, his love or our love for him must be supreme to all other loves because until you love him with all your heart, uh, you're going to put other people above him, and, and that's, that's, not, that's not good. And so as, as leaders then, men as, of our wives and family, we must love them as Christ loved the church. Husbands, right, you love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He gave himself to the church. He died for the church. Husbands, you, this is, I mean, love is not a feeling, right? Love is not Hollywood. I hope, I hope we're past that. I hope you know that, Right? The, the stuff you see in the movies, is, it's just rubbish. All right? Love is serving. It's giving of yourself to someone else. And if we're going to get in the game and really step up and be a, a godly man or a godly woman, we've got to excel in love. We have to be men that love. Okay, lastly is uh, rise up. This is what the R stands for. Rise up. Rise up up. Joshua. 
Um, and by rising up, I mean we, we just we step up to the plate and swing, if you're going to use a baseball analogy. Or you take a shot, you know, if you're using a hockey analogy. You go for it. I'm talking about courage here. I'm talking about strength. We need to be men of courage. We need to be women of courage. Courage is the quality of being able to act bravely under difficulty or in the face of opposition. Being prepared to do dangerous or risky things in obedience to God in the belief that he will strengthen, guard, and protect his people. Men of courage, man. You know, I'm, I, I don't think I'm a naturally courageous person, but I've learned that it's my role as a man to step up and here we go. <laughs> you know, God, I'm, I'm, try, I'm just going to go for it. I mean, Joshua chapter 1, God's raising up Joshua as this new leader of the people. Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses, God speaks to Joshua. Only, Joshua's the only person in the Bible who doesn't have parents. Joshua chapter 1, it says... Do you have your Bibles? Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Joshua was the son of Nun. <laughs> All right. You get five jokes today, right? Three at the beginning. All right. So Joshua, son of Nun. Moses' assistants. And so God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. The time has come for you to lead these people, Joshua. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, I'm going to give you that land. It goes through the borders of the land. Verse 5 says, no one's going to stand against you. I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to abandon you. I think this is God's word to us. He's not, he's, Jesus said, I'm going to be with you. Right? Till the end of the age, he's going to be with you. And then he says this in verse 6, Joshua 1, 6. Be strong and courageous. You are the one who will lead. And I think this is the word of God for somebody here today. Be strong and courageous. You are the one that will lead. I get it, man. No, my wife's doing a great job. <laughs> I don't, I'm, just, I'm good. No. You know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk more about this as we get to 1 Corinthians 11. But brothers, read 1 Corinthians 11, the first, just the first few verses. And then you tell me who's supposed to lead your family. You are the one who will lead these people. Uh, Joshua is getting ready to accept this awesome new position in, the, in, in this role in life. You're the leader. He's going to have to lead God's people into many battles. He's going to have to deal with many different conflicts. He was going to need to have courage. Leadership takes courage. He's going to have to push through. You know, you, you can't get courage by reading a book, man. You know, you can't get courage by taking a webinar or signing up for a course. I don't even know if you can get courage by spending time with other courageous people. The only way to get courage is by stepping out, man. It's by doing something that requires courage. You know, you can go to the gym all day long, but until you pick up those weights and start lifting, you're not going to build any muscles. You know, courage requires doing courageous things. Courage requires doing courageous things. Brothers, some of your wives are desperate for you to lead them. Some of your wives are dying inside because you're not leading. It'd be easy. It's, you know, it's so easy to stay home and sip a drink and watch TV. But God was saying, Joshua, not today. It's your turn to get in the fight. It's your turn to rise up and be a leader. I, and I haven't really brought this into this message, but all of, all of these men that we're talking about were fathers. Philip had four daughters. Um, Moses, they, they, they were all fathers. And Joshua 24, 15, it says, but as for me and my house, or me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Mrs. Joshua didn't say that. Mrs. Joshua didn't say, no, it's okay, honey. No, no, Joshua's saying, you know what? We're serving the Lord. We're going to church on Sunday. We're, being, we're going to that two-for-two two group. We're going to go early and help them do this or that. We're going to pray before we eat. That was Mr. Joshua. 
that said that. You're the leader of your family, brothers. And okay, so 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 to the single brothers here, or maybe maybe you don't have a family. God's, you, you're you're still a leader. Do you understand that? You still have to lead yourself. And maybe God's preparing you for what you don't know. Man, this world leads needs leaders. Oh my goodness, this church needs leaders. I would love to have all of our leaders rise up from within the church and not have to bring people in from from outside. It starts in the home. Make the decision that you are going to serve the Lord by being courageous. Guys, it's in you, okay? Because God's put it there. It's in you. None of us know what we're going to face in this life, but it's it's going to require courage. Some of you have had cancer. Cancer requires courage, doesn't it? Having that tough conversation with the family member. Some of you have done that, haven't you? You've had to have a difficult conversation with somebody. That requires courage. Maybe giving a presentation at work or school, that requires courage. Leading people into the unknown requires courage. But you can do it because God is with you. Worship team's going to come up now. Which one of these that we've talked about is for you today? Maybe you need to start that journey and say, I'm going to follow God in obedience. I've been a Christian in name only, but now it's time to really obey the Lord. F stands for follow God. Maybe it's acting with purity. Maybe there's, you know, maybe, maybe you need to come clean, brothers. Nobody's, there's no shame in this. Nobody's going to think any less of you if you just confess your sin to somebody and say, from today on, man, I'm going to act with purity. Maybe all of your conversation, maybe you need to talk about the Lord. Maybe all of your conversation is about sports or something else. You need to start talking about the Lord. Maybe you get angry really easily and you need to have more patience in your life. Maybe you need to excel in love a little bit. You just need to rise up with courage. We're going to sing a song right now. And... um, I'd like to ask all the men to stand up. I'm just going to pray. I want to pray for you. So if, if you're a man here, if you could just stand up, I'm going to pray for you right now. And then after this song, we're going to worship with this song. And, uh, and then we're going to have, um, uh, you guys are available to pray for people, right? So Richard and Debbie will be up front to pray for people. And if there's anything going on in your life you need prayer for, um, you can come and pray with Richard and Debbie. Father, I just lift up these brothers, God, and I pray that you would inspire them, exhort them, and encourage them to be the men that you've called them to be, Lord, that, that they would rise up, that they would, would follow you in faith, that they would act with purity, God, that they would, would talk about you, Lord. They'd be patient men, that they'd be loving men. God, do the work that only you can do, and I pray that that, that that prompting of the Spirit in their heart would be met with, with just this willingness, this posture of, God, please do this work in me, Lord. And begin now, Lord. And now why don't we all stand up and we'll just close in, 